Thank you all for joining us this afternoon's Lunch and Learn conversation around the North Atlantic right whale. I am Carla Gunther, the Chief Scientist for the Maine Center for Coastal Fisheries. You may have happened to see the Island Advantage column from the, set, from the center this week where we talked about all the latest happenings um, around the regulations around the lobster fishery and the North Atlantic right whale. And indeed, there is much ado about this uh, endangered critter of the sea. And we have an esteemed panel joining us today to talk about what it is we do and don't know about the hot topic of conversation for this animal. Uh, we have Aaron Summers, the Director of Biomonitoring and Assessment at Maine Department of Marine Resources. We have Nick, Dr. Nick Record from, uh, from the Bigelow Lab. He's an oceanographer primarily. And we have uh, Dr. Tim Cole, who's a research fishery biologist from the Northeast Fisheries Science Center. And um, his image in this cover slide looks very similar to him right now with his headphones and his speaker microphone. So he must feel really comfortable with the headgear. <laughs> All right, thanks folks. Um, and a uh, thank you to our, our series sponsors, Bar Harbor Bank and Trust, the Fishermen's Wives Association here in Stonington and Camden National Bank. So without further ado about introductions, let's get into the whale ado um, and we'll start with Nick. Thanks Carla and hi everybody. Just give me a moment to share my screen. Okay, hi everyone. Um, I'm gonna start by giving you a little bit of a rundown of the connection between climate and, and changing environmental conditions and uh, what right whales have been doing. As Carla said, I'm a senior scientist at Bigelow Lab and uh, I direct an ocean forecasting center there, which we're hoping will um, be a tool to help uh, predict where these whales are gonna be in the future. But just to start off, I wanted to start off with a picture of an actual right whale. Uh, this was the first time I ever saw a right whale. It was about 15 years ago. And I, I think it might've even been the last time I saw one. Uh, we saw quite a few that day, uh, but um, I don't get out on the water as much as I used to. But it's a, it's a really amazing animal. Uh, I, I've been um, wanting to try to figure out which whale this is. You can see on the, on the uh, front of the head here, there are these callosities. And right whale researchers can use those to identify every single North Atlantic right whale that's in the ocean. And I have yet to uh, track down which one this is, but I'm really curious to know if it's still swimming around the ocean um, now, 15 years later. Uh, but anyway, so, so to kind of dig into how climate has been affecting right whales, I'm gonna focus on one particular turning point that started a few years ago. Um, there, these headlines are from 2017, and um, most of them come from, are referring to right whale mortalities in Canadian waters, but some in US waters as well. And um, what started around 2017 was, was what management calls an unusual mortality event, uh, which means basically the right whales were dying at unusually high numbers. And to kind of give you a graphical picture of what that looked like, here's what the right whale population was doing over kind of many years. So I, you know, I saw those right whales sometime here in the early to mid aughts and um, the right whale population had been recovering slowly but surely with some, some bumps in the road. And then around 2010, there was a pretty distinct turnaround in the population levels this is just showing the total number of North Atlantic right whales. And it started declining until you get to kind of the time period we're in now where there are lots of right whale um, mortalities happening. And um, a lot of this was happening around the same time that people were describing the Gulf of Maine as one of the fastest warming places in the ocean. And so we set out to try to, to kind of ask the question of whether those two things were connected and if we could sort of figure out what, if they were, what was, um, what was going on. So to, to, um, to kind of take the picture into like map space, this is um, 
This is the kind of data you can get from, from NOAA. Uh, they're just, in general, wherever right whales have been seen, you can, there's a, a website you can go to and, and plot these up and you, you can choose particular years. Here I've just chosen 2004 to 2007. You have to be pretty careful with this kind of data because it shows you where the whales have been found, but it doesn't show you where people have or haven't looked. So take it with a grain of salt. But I'm putting it up here just to kind of illustrate some of the changes. So up until around 2010, there was this really predictable migration pattern. So right whales pretty much come to the Gulf of Maine to feed. And they've had this historically, this really regular pattern where they would sort of show up in Massachusetts Bay and Cape Cod Bay in the winter. They'd sort of move down to this area. This is Cape Cod, by the way, just to get you oriented. Here's the coast of Maine, Nova Scotia up here. So then in kind of the late winter, spring, they'd move down to this area called the Great South Channel. Eventually by late summer and fall, they'd be up here in the mouth of the Bay, and Fund Bay of Fundy and so on. And because this pattern was fairly regular from year to year, it gave uh, a, like a kind of a pretty good option for being able to manage them. We could have predictable closed areas or, um, or moving shipping lanes, for example, up here around where we knew right whales were kind of going to aggregate every year. Um, and, and it turns out that 2010 was around, around that time, it was when those fairly regular yearly migration patterns changed into something um, less predictable. So here I just pulled that same um, data from NOAA from 2017 to 2019. And just a reminder to take the data with a grain of salt, but it does illustrate um, the point I wanna make. And I've highlighted kind of these two areas where you can see a pretty, um, pretty sharp change. So here up around the Bay of Fundy, um, you see many fewer right whales. And that's been borne out by, by the data that's collected up there. And then here, south of Cape Cod and, and Nantucket and so on, there's a lot more. Um, and so um, I'm just quickly gonna focus on what happened here and then I'll wrap up with just a mention of what happened here before passing it on to the other folks. Uh, okay, so like I said, right whales pretty much come to the Gulf of Maine to feed. They're eating uh, this animal, it's called a copepod or in particular, it's a Calanus copepod. It has this bubble of fat, which you can see here. Um, and that's why it's uh, so tasty to right whales. They need to put on a lot of weight because, um, uh, well, they just have really high energy requirements. And this map is showing the seasonal cycle of these uh, lipid rich copepods. And you can see here's the Gulf of Maine. We're right about at the Southern range um, of where you find them. The map is kind of moving as, as the seasons change. So some times of year they're high and other times of year um, they're low and they actually have a hibernation sort of like bears where they put on lots of fat um, and, then the, um, and then the whales go for them. So what happened in the Gulf of Maine? Uh, and this is where the warming and the whales food is connected. So you probably have heard or read in the news, the Gulf of Maine is one of the fastest warming places the, on the planet. It has to do with these two major ocean currents, the Gulf Stream here in this reddish color and the Labrador Current here in this bluish color. The colors on the map below, by the way, this is from a, a climate study that looked at how warm temperatures would be by the year 2100. And again, on this color scale, you can see that the deep, this is the deep waters of the Gulf of Maine here are some of the fastest, predicted to be some of the fastest warming on the planet. And indeed, we're already seeing that. And the reason basically has to do with how these two currents interact. There's a really cold current, a really warm current, and they intersect just outside of this uh, deep channel into the Gulf of Maine. And as the climate warms, especially in the Arctic, it's changing the characteristics of these two major ocean currents, basically so that we get more of this really warm uh, Gulf Stream associated water in the Gulf of Maine, especially in the deep areas and you can see this arrow loops right around to that area in the mouth of the Bay of Fundy, where we previously had seen lots of right whales. And, and this shift, because their prey is associated with cold water, this shift has meant no food for right whales in that region. Um, it, had, it was a pretty marked shift in 2010. You see a pretty mark sh marked shift in right whales using this feeding habitat at the same time. And it's around the same time that the population declined. 
And the decline is for a couple of reasons. For one, you know, just the lack of food has lowered the calving rates. But as whales have stopped visiting this area, they have also started um, apparently foraging other places, basically looking for the next best feeding area. There are many more of them have been going up here into Canadian waters where those same protections don't exist. And um, especially early on when Canada was sort of caught by surprise by all these right whales, um, lots of them were uh, getting entangled or struck by ships and so on. So part of the, part of the connection with climate is just, um, you know, it's harder for them to find their food. But a spinoff of that is that for us trying to manage the whales, we have less of a sense of where whales are gonna be. So it makes it um, a lot harder for us to put those kinds of protections in place. We as, you know, people in general. So I'll just wrap up by mentioning quickly this, this area south of Nantucket. This is, um, this is a model produced by a scientist at the New England Aquarium named Dan Pendleton, who um, many years, a few years before this shift, I should say, predicted this area south of, of Nantucket and Cape Cod to be good right whale feeding habitat. And then you can see, this is a plot of some of his data um, in the subsequent years. And, and also what I showed you earlier, the whales have found that area and they're using it a lot now. It's creating some new conflicts potentially with, um, with offshore wind. Uh, but the point I wanna make here is a lot of these changes are associated with changes in underlying oceanography and, and partly due to climate. And I, and I believe that we have some ability to make predictions. Both of these changes that, we've, that I highlighted here were predicted before they happened by, uh, by some of the papers that you find in the scientific literature. And so that, that hope, that aspiration is something that I'm bringing forward in um, this forecasting center I mentioned, the Tandy Center for Ocean Forecasting. So hopefully we'll be able to offer that up as a partial um, solution to right whales suddenly showing up in, in unexpected places. And this is just my team, by the way. These are the other um, uh, ocean and computer geeks who work with me uh, on trying to make ocean forecasts to hopefully help out the, uh, the situation. So I'll stop there and I will pass it on to the next speaker. Thank you, Nick. And our next speaker will be Erin Summers, who has been working with whales for much of her career and also as a representative from the state of Maine on the whale take reduction team. Thanks, Erin. Yeah, hi, thank you for having me. Um, let me just pull this up really quick. Okay, can you see that? Give me a thumbs up, Nick. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> awesome, okay. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, yeah, my name is Erin. I've been working with the state of Maine for the Department of Marine Resources for about 15 years, um, all of which has included um, work on the endangered right whale and mostly around the entanglement issues associated with them that Nick um, alluded to. I'm going to talk mostly today about um, sort of the status of the species, what we're doing in management, and how the state of Maine is participating and contributing to those um, conversations. If I can get the slide to advance. <laughs> Hang on one second. There we go. Um, okay, this is a graphic that was created by NOAA Fisheries, um, just, and it kind of puts everything in one place for the context of what's going on with the population. There's a lot to unpack here, but um, you'll see in the background that um, population figure that Nick showed where we started in decline in 2010. Um, the numbers on the right, there is a new updated population assessment that was released earlier this week during the Right Wheel Consortium annual meeting. Um, that is a model, that is a number that's um, modeled around this time every year and uh, says that as of 2020, there's roughly 336 right whales left in the population. Um, this for a second. Okay. 
Um, so this part of this describes where we are, wh where, why we are, where we are. So um, there's been, Nick mentioned the unusual mortality event um, that has occurred since 2017 in um, largely in Canadian waters, but also in U.S. waters. Um, those those mortalities have consisted of um, entanglements and also vessel strikes. Um, at the bottom, you'll see the calving rates. So we've also had a number of years with really low calving rates. So we had one year, I think it was in 2018, where we didn't have any born. Um, this past year was a good year with um, 18 calves or 19 calves. Um, okay. So right whales are in decline um, and continue to be so every year. Um, I already mentioned that entanglements are one of the leading known causes of mortality in right whales, along with vessel strikes. Um, the kicker with the entanglements is that in most cases, we do not recover gear, nor do we know where gear comes from um, when we do take it off of an entangled whale. Um, so without having any known origins for fishery or location, it makes it really difficult uh, to target any regulatory measures uh, to reduce entanglement to just the fisheries that are um, impacting the species. Um, so without, without some of that information, we're left with trying to manage a species on a broad scale, um, which has proven difficult. Um, I've got a picture here on the right of just some standard lobster gear. And mostly what we're talking about here is entanglements in the vertical line piece of fixed fishing gear. So management for right whales has been occurring for a long time. Um, man like right whales in this context are being managed through um, the Marine Mammal Protection Act. And under the Marine Mammal Protection Act, there's something called bio potential biological removal, which is a level that is set with a really specific calculation that says how many um, animals and a population can be taken. Um, and still have the population recover. Uh, for right whales, that has currently been set at 0 0.7, um, which is an annual average. So we can take less than an average of less than one whale a year and have them um, recover. So PBR or potential biological removal is sort of the um, goalpost. If you are above that, then something called a take reduction team is triggered. For right whales, this was triggered in 1997 and uh, DMR has been a member on that, of that team since then. There's been the figure on the right, you don't have to kind of unpack everything that's listed on there, but um, this, there's just been a number of different modifications to the take reduction plan, trying to get uh, mortalities under 0.7 uh, for a number of years, and that has not been accomplished. And if, as long as that continues to be the case, um, they will, likely keep coming back and amending the plan to try to get uh, to that goal. Um, so that brings us to where we are currently with management. Um, we, the take reduction team started meeting on the current rule back in 2018. Um, the final rule just published this past September. Um, I'm gonna go through what's in it really quickly, but um, we can come back to it later if people have questions. Major element of the plan are some additional closures. Um, just side note that the closure off of Maine has been delayed by a court case. Um, so that's not happening this year. There's also a number of gear modifications, including minimum number of trawls on a particular vertical line to reduce the number of vertical lines that are occurring in the water column, um, reducing the breaking strength of line that is in the water uh, to under 1,700 pounds, which is the level at which right whales are thought to be able to break and rope and get free, um, and gear marking so that we can um, collect more data on where some of the entanglements might be happening and uh, build some better information on where to target regulations in the future. Uh, this is a quick picture of the closures that are in the take reduction plan. Um, this figure on the bottom left, these blue ones were already in the plan with the green ones being the new ones. This is the LMA1 or the closure off of Maine blown up uh, larger. Um, these closures were largely chosen by no fisheries through um, a hotspot analysis that was done using the decision support tool. 
The decision support tool um, is something that's being developed to overlay where gear and whales um, and something called a threat score uh, are kind of all overlapped. So you can um, be able to compare where risk might be highest and where you might be able to get um, risk reduction benefit by particular measures. So you'll see, for example, in January, um, the risk that is assumed to be within the LMA1 or off main closure uh, using that tool. Uh, this is just um, a this is just a figure of the trawl minimums that are required off of Maine now. It's the, the takeaway message here is really complicated. Um, thus, <laughs> there are a lot of different trawl minimums um, based on distance from shore and by lobster fishing zone. Um, DMR held probably 30 meetings with the industry when developing this plan. Um, to ask them for their feedback on what they could um, and couldn't do in different areas so that uh, whatever was put forward fit with their uh, fishing styles in different areas, which take into consideration um, how they culturally fish, but also things like the oceanography of the area, particularly in zone A, um, where they fish a little bit differently than other parts of the coast. Um, and there's things like gear marking and the week requirements that are in there as well. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this stuff, but happy to answer questions if people have them. Um, so I already mentioned the state's role a little bit. Um, DMR, like NOAA Fisheries, has a dual mission here where we're trying to support the lobster fishery um, and also conserving an endangered species. Um, I mentioned a little bit about management with the fishery. Um, we have these seven lobster zones that are here on the left um, and we can utilize a zone council system where we go out and talk to the zones and kind of ask them for their feedback on different measures that um, might suit their zone uh, better so that we can maintain a lot of the um, individual regional owner operator kind of uh, fishing boat specific measures that are important to them. Um, DMR is a member of the take reduction team. Um, I also sit as a member on the Northeast implementation team for the right whale recovery plan. And that group um, is putting forward recommendations to um, NOAA fisheries for things like um, priorities for management, for monitoring um, and trying to push forward um, a number of things around vessel strikes at the moment. Um, and we are also spending a lot of um, money, frankly, and staff time on sponsoring and conducting research to inform some of these management needs. So a lot of collaborative research has been done over the past few years with the fishery. Um, we did a survey to understand how they're rigging their gear all throughout the Gulf of Maine region, including off Maine, but also the offshore fishery in LMA3. Um, how they're fishing their gear, what kind of ropes they're using, how they rig it. Um, we had uh, over 800 respondents to that. Um, we had, we've had hundreds of fishermen donate vertical lines that we broke on a uh, tensile testing machine, which um, tested the breaking strength of different kinds of ropes that they're using in their vertical lines. Uh, we had workshops of fishermen come to Booth Bay Harbor and test different weak point options, some of which are pictured here on the right. So different ways to tie um, tie or splice rope together to try to weaken their vertical lines. Um, we worked with them, with fishermen, to try to develop um, prototypes of an inline weak link. So this is pictured here, this plastic chain link um, that breaks at 1,700 pounds and has been an approved option for the 1,700 pound breaking strength regulation. Um, so those should be on the shelves, we're told, hopefully in January. Um, but we're, we have some, we have a couple hundred of them to get out to fishermen for testing now. Um, in addition to that, we um, have also um, collected a lot of information on board fishing vessels. Um, this picture on the left has a load cell that we put out on a lot of fishing vessels right above the block. So as they're hauling their gear and the rope comes up over the block and into the hauler, we can um, determine the hauling strain of their gear. Um, on their vertical line. Um, and we were able to use that information um, to sort of fit the regulations so that we can take safety into mind. Um, 
looking at the way they fish, the depth of the water, and the strain on their vertical lines, um, this figure sort of shows, you know, where this black line shows 1,700 pounds. So this figure shows where um, and under what gear configurations and what depth we might get hauling strains above 1,700 pounds. So we wouldn't be able to put a 1,700 pound weak link at the bottom of this particular vertical line because uh, that would be very unsafe for a fishing vessel. So able to utilize some of that collaborative information that we collected with the fishery um, to try to keep the, uh, regula the regulations um, somewhere safe for them um, and tailor it to their fishing practices. Um, and this is, uh, these are some figures of modeled um, strain on gear and the differences between where they are at now and what the strain would be under the new rules. Um, so the takeaway here um, in this bottom part of the figure is that um, as you trawl up, you add more traps to a line, you increase um, the strain uh, also in these deeper depths. So um, anyone outside 12 miles is um, probably fishing gear that has a strain higher than 1,700 pounds. We have to build that into where we place those weak links so that we can keep fishing operations safe for fishermen. Um, but working with fishermen, um, has all, it also fosters buy-in um, and compliance rates when we're able to get something that um, works better for them into their existing gear and they don't have to buy all new weak rope or something like that. And then I will just end quickly with kind of what we're doing on the right whale research side of it. Uh, this is a figure of um, sound traps, um, some in the water, some almost in the water, and some still on order. Um, so none of these existed before, but we are doing a massive push to try to get a lot of listening devices out into the Gulf of Maine uh, to record right whale vocalizations and other large whale vocalizations uh, to be able to um, feed into models, potentially into some of Nick's forecasting models um, to tell us uh, the distribution and habitat use of right whales year round. Um, so, all of these um, sort of pink purple um, sites inshore, um, these are eight sites that are currently being done collaboratively between the Northeast Fishery Science Center and DMR. Uh, we're putting them out um, and they're analyzing the data. Um, and those have been out for almost two years now. And we have some preliminary information back from those. All of those are placed within state waters inside three miles. Um, these darker blue ones um, were purchased through a grant from the Maine Community Fund um, and uh, are being deployed and analyzed by DMR. Um, these four are out now um, and these three are being deployed next week um, so soon. Um, these five, these green ones are something that's main, being done and maintained by UNH. I don't think that they're all out yet. Some of them are. Um, and then these grayed out uh, sites are sites that um, are on the wish list and um, on order um, through some other partnerships that we're working on right now. So hopefully within the next year, we'll have those grayed sites as well. Um, so you'll notice that um, Three of these sites are within the uh, fishery closure off of Maine um, here. And this site, DMR number seven, is actually in the proposed research array for offshore wind. Um, so we're starting monitoring out there as well. Um, these, this is preliminary information um, that I got from the Northeast Fisheries Science Center. Um, on those inshore sites, um, any, these are the site locations. If it's red, it had a detection day for right whales on it during that period. So January to June of 2020, we had uh, one detection day off of Lubeck. Um, and in the next time period, we had a detection day each in Lubeck, off Monhegan and New York. Um, and this website that I put down here is, um, is like a acoustics data portal that the Northeast Fishery Science Center developed and you can go and it looks like this and you can go on that website and look at any of the data for any of these deployments kind of all across the east coast um, 
if you, in this screenshot, I've hovered over this location, but um, so if you hover your cursor over something, uh, the information around uh, what's on that um, recorder pops up over here and you can see when there were um, detections recorded in different time periods and um, also look at glider deployments and other things like that. So all of, um, all of the acoustics data that we'll be collecting over the next few years will be uploaded to this data portal. So anybody from the public can follow along with uh, the analysis of the detection information as well. And I think that is all that I have. I'll pass it off to Tim. Great, thank Sorry you, Eric. Really fast. There's a lot of stuff. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Aaron. I think we've already getting some questions in the Q and A, but I want to get to Tim, who has been counting whales from the air for about 20 years, so or more. Then, thank you. Let's get to you, Tim. Yeah, hi. So I'm Tim Cole. I'm at the Northeast Fishery Science Center. I've been doing aerial surveys for right whales um, there for about 20 years, and I worked on some other projects in the past. Um, I also was a, a graduate of College of the Atlantic and worked out at Mount Desert Rock for a number of years doing uh, fin whale work. And, um, but for the last um, 20 years or so, I've been at the, at the Science Center in Woods Hole directing their right whale aerial surveys. And today I'm gonna to talk about the visual surveys. Um, Aaron did a great job sort of summarizing the acoustic stuff, which is a really important um, and, and very complementary to the, to the visual work that we do. And if I can get the next slide, Tate. Um, the, for the visual surveys, uh, the primary goals are to photo capture as many individuals as possible. And as um, uh, touched on earlier, just we use the callosity patterns of the whales along, on their head, which is basically sort of erupted skin that has been infested by whale lice or cyamids. And these patterns are unique to each individual. And we sort of have uh, a, a you know, topography of what the different parts of these callosities are called um, for description. And on, the, on that photograph, you can see you've got two whales that have pretty distinctively different uh, shapes of callosities on their heads. And we have teams of folks who um, are very good at identifying these individuals on site and also at the New England Aquarium in Boston, Massachusetts. They have the North Atlantic right whale catalog that has all the known catalogs over, you know, all the years of every, every, every event that's been photographed with an individual in it, they have that basically. And they have over 700 individuals, unique individuals contained in the catalog. And, um, and we submit our photographs to them and they match and give us sort of counts of how many individuals each year. And those are the data that are used to estimate the, the total population each year. And that's the, the graphs that um, both Nick and Aaron shared showing the, the decrease in the population is based on these mark recapture data. Basically when an individual hasn't been seen for a long time, it becomes more and more likely that it has died and sort of um, you know, is subtracted from that total population estimate. Um, so an important component of our, of our visual surveys and our aerial surveys especially is going out and trying to locate and photograph as many right whales as possible, which um, kind of co conflicts a little bit with our other uh, um, goal, which next slide, please Tate, is uh, to collect line transit survey data for looking at the distribution of right whales over, over a wide area. And line transit data is different. They tend to be systematic and you typically aren't supposed to break for things because that sort of corrupts your, your, your survey data, but you're taking an, uh, uh, a distance estimate to uh, where the sighting is relative to where you are flying along a track line. And those sort of systematic distance estimated data help you generate density plots. Um, how, how many whales or the density of whales um, in, a, in a given area. And this, these, these are the data that basic, basically supply the, um, the modeling efforts that are used in uh, habitat modeling and uh, uh, the, density, uh, the decision support tool. Basically uh, using these data to 
extrapolate to some degree to other areas where habitat conditions are similar and where there might be additional whales. But it's all based on these sightings data that are collected from the visual surveys. Next slide, please. So the Northeast Fisheries Science Center is, is just one of, of many different survey efforts that are uh, conducted each year. Um, this is a little bit of an older slide, but it, it captures sort of the pre-COVID level of effort um, typical in a given year. And on this slide, there's, there's um, the, the yellow bracketed areas and, and assets. Those are the surveys that are really directed towards collecting the photographs of individual whales for that mark recapture analysis. And then the white areas, um, there's one off of south of Long Island. That was the New York State's survey efforts for wind energy um, stuff. Those were um, the very systematic uh, sort of coverage, taking distance sampling um, data to calculate uh, density of actually all kinds of species, not just right whales, but basically everything they saw and the dashed line, those are from the, the Northeast Fishery Science Center as well. Those are uh, the uh, Atlantic uh, Marine Assessment Program for Protected Species or AMAPS program, which actually extends all the way down. Uh, they sort of abut with the Southeast region surveys that follow the same protocols to cover a broad area systematically collecting distance sampling information to get density estimates and abundance estimates for a wide range of species. So for right whales, the, those, those data are not used so much for population as they are for some other species that are more numerous because right whales are, are very rare and, um, and fairly cryptic. Um, actually, the, the mark recapture information gives you a much better population estimate, but those broad scale systematic surveys really help to uh, point out um, habitat and, and other potential habitats that might be worth directing flights to, to to look for more right whales. Next slide, please. So this, this shows the effort uh, between 1998 and 2016, just uh, all the way down the coast. And you can see it's, it's pretty extensive. The black dots are all the right whale sightings from these different survey efforts. Um, the further offshore lines that are sort of, uh, you know, not quite as much uh, thickly packed, uh, those are actually shipboard surveys um, primarily, but all of these data are used to sort of chart the, the right whale habitat and habitat preferences. And uh, I think now for the decisions, these, these are the data that were used for the decision support tool to identify areas where right whales and, and you know, other threats, both fishing and shipping might overlap. I think these, these information have been, um, you know, now more data from more current years have been incorporated. Next slide, please. So just to bring it up to date, uh, since it, this is a plot of our just aerial survey effort um, over the last 12 months, um, showing you know sort of our broad scale systematic coverage over a wide range of area the the survey effort in the central gulf of maine and down along the coast of new jersey new jersey and along the coast of maine those are all primarily uh the northeast fishery science center surveys and then in cape cod bay um, and east of boston you can see very densely packed lines those are primarily flown by the center for coastal studies um, and in the spring, there tends to be quite a few sightings in that region. And I, I should mention too, that the, the dots <clears throat> are the right whale sightings and they're color coded by day of year. So the, the darker colors, sort of the dark blues um, and purples, those are wintertime sightings. And then as you move into to summer and uh, it, it turns appropriately green. And then uh, towards the end of the year, November, December, those are yellow. And so you can see in, in the Cape Cod Bay area where the Center for Coastal Studies is the primary uh, survey platform, that's a lot of whales packed in there in the spring. Um, whereas south of New England, those are both uh, surveys from the Northeast Fishery Science Center as well as the New England Aquarium. There's a, a, a quite a few whales there and, and their occurrence there is, is pretty much year round. Uh, and this, th this plot I just generated this morning from, from a whale map, which, uh, next slide please, um, actually is, is readily accessible to anyone. Um, if you look up the NOAA 
uh, right whale sightings, uh, you'll get this landing page. It shows you information, uh, both acoustic detections, as well as right whale sightings um, from the last couple of weeks. Um, and then sort of there's a button, that's sort of a, the stack of papers on the far right hand side, sort of the upper right hand corner there. That has, if you click on that, that has a number of layers. Um, so you can overlay different closure areas or shipping lanes or, or other information you might wanna display. So you can go in there and sort of examine the data yourself. Um, next slide, please. If you follow the, the, the whale map uh, link, it will actually bring you to a, a much more interactive map. And I, this got a little bit covered up, but um, it has uh, uh, several tabs on the left side that allow you to sort of select different time periods. You can either select a specific date or a range of, of uh, uh, a, a date range amongst years and also select what sort of platform you want to see the data uh, from. Uh, it also includes other species, so not just right whales. You can, you can choose other species like fin whale, say whale, um, humpback whale, et cetera. And you can also select different layers to show uh, nautical charts and different closure areas. So um, I would encourage folks who are interested to explore whale map as a way to see where sightings have been recently and in the past. Um, it, I think it's a very informative site. And that's all I have. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Tim and Aaron and Nick, and um, give you all a digital round of applause for your contribution. And um, I guess we'll roll right into it. I see, Aaron, that you have been, and Nick also, you've both been typing in some real time answers to our many questions. And let's see. Um, I'll pick up where, let's see, there's been, I, I guess I'll first offer Nick or Aaron, do you want to give a verbal backup to anything you've typed into the chat? No, Aaron, <laughs> no. Um, I, well, there's one that I haven't answered because I didn't understand. Okay. I wasn't okay. sure what they were asking. The question around looking into trap retrieval after right whales leave an area. Um, not sure. Yeah, I'm not sure yeah. either. Is, is that assuming that like whales are scooping up a bunch of traps as they swim through? Is that, um, I don't know. Oh, like it's, debris, like marine debris? Yeah, I like guess. Ghost gear removal? Um, I'm not sure. Yeah. Um, there have been some ghost gear removal projects, but they're not like specific to right whales. I mean, I think part of the um, part of the issue um, around right whales in the Gulf of Maine is that um, unlike other habitats like Cape Cod Bay, South of Nantucket, Bay of Fundy, it can be, um, you know, we get individual whales that are transiting, not necessarily aggregations of whales that are like, 30 whales plus in one spot at a time. So, um, you know, there's, there's less, I think, distinct boundaries around like when they're coming in and when they're leaving the Gulf of Maine, the more kind of um, in and out of it a lot as individuals um, and kind of transiting through. So that um, if you're targeting ghost gear removal around something like that, that might be a difficult prospect. I'm not sure if that's what they were getting at. But. Okay. Great. Um, okay, we've got the answer to Canada, to the work going on between the US and Canada. And then Maggie, you've asked about the calving rates being higher. You guys were so efficient typing in answers. Um, <laughs> we spend so, so much time on Zoom these days. <laughs> we, just, we just know how to multitask. <laughs> okay, well, um, I'm actually seeing, oh, open too, let's see, what are those two? Aaron, really great to see the DMR and other buoys on your map slide. Will detections from these buoys be added to whale map and or the Science Center data stream? Yes, so the, um, the eight buoys that are inside state waters that have been out for a year and a half or so are already part of the acoustics portal. 
So the passive acoustic data portal that the science center maintains, they're already in there. So you could go in there now and look at when exactly those detection days occurred, um, look at each buoy and, uh, and see all the information around it. Those are in there now. We're working with them on adding um, the ones that we're deploying now. Um, so those will be in there and they'll also be on the Northeast data portal so that they can be used in conversations around siting um, and conversations around offshore wind. Um, so yeah, those will all be added. So the locations and the data will be um, uploaded there when they're analyzed so you can follow along. Yeah. Okay, so I, I, in case people aren't reading the answer, you were asked whether these were going to be real-time data or do they have to be retrieved and then added in? Yeah. These particular um, deployments are something called a sound trap. So it's, um, it's an archival device. So it is continuously recording 24 hours a day, for, uh, like all year round um, recording. And then it's moored to the bottom. We ha it has an active acoustic release. So we release it on site every five months or so, um, swap out the batteries, download the data, and then redeploy it. Um, so it's an archival device, not real time. Um, so there'll be a lag in there when after we get the information. Um, there are some real time, um, well, near real time, things being done in the Gulf of Maine with gliders. Um, there's a website called Robots for Whales that is part of HUI, um, Mark Baumgartner's group. Um, he has been over the last few years flying a glider through the Gulf of Maine during the winter time. Um, and detecting right whales. And he puts all that information um, up on that website. And there's an additional glider in the Gulf of Maine um, out of the University of Maine and Neil Pettigrew's group that he's outfitted with um, whale acoustic devices as well. So that glider is actually currently out in the Gulf of Maine. Earlier in October, it like flew down near um, Mount Desert Island. Um, and I believe this next coming week, it will be entering the um, closure area. Um, so that is um, because the gliders can come up to the surface and download their data to satellites, that is more near real time um, than the archival devices. But those are available on Robots for Whales and also on the NIMS acoustics portal that I showed you. Okay, Th thank you. Um, <laughs> So with the shift to a more southerly distribution, how is offshore exploration affecting individuals south of the Cape? We don't really know yet. I think that the, the potential impacts are the, the acoustic disturbance and then the, the increased vessel traffic. There are um, marine mammal observers on all the exploratory ships, you know, keeping an eye out for whales to make sure that if any are within a certain distance, that any kind of uh, um, you know, uh, um, I think they call them. I can't remember what they're called. The the loud noises they're making is turned off until the whales are, are back out of the area. Um, but in terms of the effect that it has, there's there have been systematic surveys conducted by the New England Aquarium over the last ten years, sort of charting the right whales distribution in that region. Um, they recently just ran out of funding, so they don't uh, right now have surveys going on, which needs to be restarted so that we can, you know, have sort of a before, during, and after picture of the whales distribution, um, both within the wind energy area and beyond it. Because um, one of the hard things to tease apart is the effects of climate change on the on the shift of the whales versus the you know potential disturbances that uh, might be affecting their their residency in that area. Great, thank you. Um, so I'm guessing this is for Aaron, but it may be broader. The cost of lost equipment is important to fisher people. Will funds be located to help with 1700 pound line breakage issues, such as recovering the traps lost due to the new breakage strength, et cetera? Yeah, so um, in some of the, gr we have several grants that we've used to develop some of the weak point options. Um, and we have funds available in those grants for anyone testing some of that gear to be able to get reimbursed. Um, but on a broader scale, as it's implemented in the fishery this coming May, um, I would say 
Um, not in hand now, but that's something that the congressional delegation is working really hard on, um, securing funds that can be used to um, offset some of those costs and reimburse um, fishermen for any costs, whether it be lost gear or having to buy something new or, um, you know, differences there. So, um, yeah, that that's something that the congressional delegation is working really hard on. And I think you'll probably hear more about that. Um, relatively soon as they get their uh, appropriations all worked out. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, oh, Bob, your question about tagging just got answered by Nick. And um, let's see, I'll go on to any additional info on the cute whale food, that fatty, yummy critter. Is it being studied as far as habitat and heating environment effects? I think that's you, Nick. <laughs> Uh, yeah, um, it's so callanus is not just important for whales. It's also important for um, like lots and lots of species in the Gulf of Maine because it's so because it hibernates and it packs on all those fats. And one of the reasons we have such a productive ecosystem in the Gulf of Maine is because of that species. Lobster, larval lobster eat it, herring eat it, uh, seabirds eat it, and you know other other fatty fish rely on things like herring and so on. So it's really kind of like a keystone species. Um, so there is a lot of effort going into studying it. Uh, you know, it's one of these things where we can try to monitor and predict its decline, but there's not a whole lot. We c it's not like we could restock the Gulf of Maine for Calanus or something like that. So it's really about trying to figure out what are the environmental conditions going to look like and where and when are we still going to see um, good, cal good calamus abundances and where and when are we not going to? And to try to use that information to help us plan for the future. Great. Thanks. Um, Nancy, you are full of questions. With changing aquatic environment, are new species available for fisher people to market? And that is a really big question. Um, does anyone on this panel want to take that? Um, I mean, you might be better for that, Carla, but, uh, <laughs> um, our menhaden fishery is kind of case in point in some of that, like that used to be a really small scale, like you, you, you know, take what you can get if it comes this year. And it was like, will they come this year? Will they not? It was kind of always a question. Menhaden are a popular replacement for herring for bait for a lobster fisherman. Um, and now it's not so much a question of if they're coming, it's like, how much can we get away with landing? <laughs> um, which is kind of an issue on the assessment side, but we won't go into that. <laughs> um, Carla, do you have any other thoughts? Um, well, this is a tough one because this is kind of the million dollar question. I, I get interviews by lots of food magazines asking just this, and there isn't really a, a culinary critter that is coming up in short order um, there, you know, there's talk about striped bass, there's talk about black sea bass, or, you know, there's all these different critters that are coming, but are they coming in a harvestable quantity um, anytime soon to offset this? So, I mean, have no fear, there will be fishable, edible animals here but when, and when we have the access to fish them, when we lose our, our current populations or the regulatory structure that supports us fishing them. So right. <laughs> that's unfortunately- We've had blue crabs there. in many places, egg bearing yep. blue crabs, uh, which is interesting. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're little, seeing those. I can give a little climate perspective on that question. Yeah, there you go, Nick. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that's changing as the climate changes, it's not just, you know, who's in the Gulf of Maine, but another, I guess, dimension that's changing is the year to year variability. So if you were to look 10 or 20 years ago, each year was more similar to the previous year than they are now, which means it, it takes many years to figure out what the new Gulf of Maine looks like. And, uh, you know, at this point, we also don't know when those changes are gonna settle into a new system. That, spinning off of that map I showed where those two currents intersect, we're at this, really, this part of the ocean that's really sensitive to climate change. 
And then there's the whole issue of, you know, we don't know when people are going to start to turn down, down the dial on emissions. You know, things might start to settle down in 20 years, or they might start to settle down in 100 years. And um, so we're kind of, we're kind of entering a new sort of um, type of environment, one that changes much more frequently than what we're used to historically. So that's the climate perspective. All I'm really saying is it makes that question a lot harder to answer than it would have been in a more stable climate. And in addition to that, that's just figuring out if things are going to be here. And then there's the whole settling the regulatory framework so there can be access to it. And um, we may not be able to create access until after we know they're here or going to be here. <laughs> so that is a, a long, a long process. Um, we have another question about whether or not aquaculture is filling those gaps and, or could it fill those gaps? And I think I, I'll offer, I'll, anyone from the panel, I'll offer it to you all first about aquaculture. I mean, I, I would just say that like the number of aquaculture lease applications that come to DMR is like exponentially increasing. Um, and we've had to hire a bunch of new staff to try to catch up with the backlog. So go ahead, Carla. The, the only thing I was going to say is that the species that we're looking at culturing, um, not, to, not that capacity couldn't be upscaled, but I just don't think we can currently produce the same, like the, they're not filling the same niches um, of what we're culturing. And um, especially, I mean, I, I don't know, I don't see what lease applications you have from like kelp versus protein, um, whether they're shellfish and what we're really looking at for production. So I don't, it's still a big, a big question mark as to how aquaculture fits into the, the culinary end of, of produ marine production. Um, and then do I have another? Okay, Aaron, can you talk about what DMR is doing to support research availability or adoption of on-demand fishing gear? <laughs> Yeah, I marked live because that's just easier. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> good question. Um, yeah, so, you know, in the recent history, there, there hasn't been a lot of interest from the fishing community in um, sort of delving into this world until kind of recently when we, when the final rule came out and there was a big closure off of Maine. Um, and there has been an uptick in interest from fishermen in at least trying some of that gear. Um, part of the deal with the closure um, is that in theory, at some point, people could be let back in if they're fishing without vertical lines. Um, that has to be done currently through an, um, an experimental fishing permit from the federal government, from NOAA Fisheries, and also from a special license from DMR. Um, because we have regulations in place for lobster management that lobster gear is required to have a buoy at the surface. Um, so to get around those requirements, you have to have those two things to fish without a buoy. That being said, um, part of the requirements for getting an EFP is to have experience with this type of gear, with, the, well, specifically the uh, acoustic release um, retrieval gear. Um, you know, and, and there are fishermen in Massachusetts that have been trying it for longer, but um, that's not necessarily the case off Maine. So there were some people that were interested, um, that are starting to be interested in testing some of that gear and getting some of that experience. They're also um, finding that a lot of the companies um, are really interested in kind of the back and forth between fishermen to change things and make the um, gear easier to use based on their vessels and their fishing styles. Um, so that, that is, um, that, that part, the testing of the actual acoustic release systems has largely been happening through the Northeast Fisheries Science Center. Their gear team there um, has built and is maintaining a gear library for acoustic retrieval or ropeless gear. They have, I think, about 100 units from a variety of different manufacturers that they will lend out to fishermen, train them on how to use them. Um, and collect data with them as they try them on their gear. They tend to give out like one or two sets of uh, retrieval gear like per fisherman. And I believe they have all a hundred-ish um, sets of gear out right now, um, or at least spoken for. So um, that's kind of amazing. 
Um, I think from the state's perspective, the largest hurdle towards um, thinking about, not even just thinking about implementing it on a large scale, but thinking about even having, allowing people to fish with it in a closed area um, it, are the problems around gear conflict and enforcement. Um, and from, for, from the state's perspective, it's not so much the bringing of the gear from the bottom to the surface um, that requires additional testing and support um, and funding. Um, it's, it's the questions around how, um, how you scale it up so that fishermen can fish around each other without the buoy at the surface. So it's replacing the functionality of the buoy, where your gear is and how other fixed gear and also mobile gear can get in and fish around each other in a small space. Um, so we are investing some, um, some money and some staff time in, in purchasing some of that, what we're calling subsea gear location technology uh, to test in conjunction with some of the fishermen that are utilizing um, the acoustic release um, retrieval gear um, so that we can start to understand like what the range of detection is for gear that's not marked on bottom. Like as you're coming up to it, what's your range that you can see it? You know, what the accuracy is around it. Like, do you have, um, how many feet or meters do you have to work with? How comfortable are mobile fishermen pulling a trawl, you know, trawling the bottom through there, um, depend like with the, the range and accuracy levels of the subsea gear location technology. So what that entails is, you know, buying some off the shelf equipment that, um, you know, put some transponders on traps on either end of the trawl and then you have like a directional hydrophone and some software gymnastics that I am not privy to um, <laughs> that displays the information for where the traps on the bottom are on your plotter. So as you're coming up to it, you can see and try to work around it. So um, we've been talking mostly around concentrating around those questions because to us, those are the bigger hurdles towards implementation on a, on a, commercial level, either in a closed area or more broadly. Um, I think that answers the question. <laughs> I, I think so too. Thank you, Erin. Um, we're about five minutes over time, but Tom um, from near Coast just had a question about satellite. Can you see and detect the right whales from satellite? Yeah, I can take this one. Okay. Uh, that's a great question, Tom. It go, it, goes back a little bit to a question that Bob asked earlier about satellite tagging of whales, which right now we can't do for right whales because of the injury that the harpoon tags cause. Um, and then the, the non-harpoon tags tend to fall off in a couple of days, but potentially seeing them in satellite imagery is a different story. I mean, you can, I can go on Google, Google earth and see like, Oh, my wood pile has been cleared out. Like every time they update, I can see little features around my house. So why not, uh, why not right whales? And there are, um, there are uh, groups doing this on both sides of the border now. There's a, an artificial intelligence uh, group um, in the US and one in Canada trying to uh, use AI, artificial intelligence. It's kind of the same technology that self-driving cars use or uh, to kind of recognize images or if you've ever used things like speech translation or um, these, these algorithms are all around us now actually. Um, and they can, uh, it looks like there's some promise for detecting whales, direct right whales, IDing right whales directly in satellite imagery. Uh, but, you know, with some caveats, you know, you're only going to see right whales mostly on pretty calm days, only when they're at the surface, um, usually when they're hanging out in an area for a, a fair bit of time. So I think there's some potential. It's kind of like acoustics. You're only going to detect right whales when they're making noise. So it's probably another piece of the puzzle that will help but it, you know, it won't be able to tell us where whales are all the time. We still need a lot of the methods that we're already using. In fact, we're even looking into whether you can use satellite imagery to find the whale food. There's a group in Norway that has shown that you can detect colonists in satellite imagery directly using some AI. And so we're looking around the Northwest Atlantic now trying to um, figure out if we can do that here. Awesome. I, I, would, I would just add to that, briefly that the, the cost of satellite imagery 
um, can be pretty high and, you know, rival that of an aerial survey. Whereas from aerial surveys, you can get a lot more information, um, you know, from, from a survey cost of the same area that a uh, satellite image would cover, you can get a lot of additional information such as individual identifications, et cetera. So it's, uh, it's a bit of a, you know, balancing act. Yeah, it's good to keep in mind, Tim, <laughs> definitely. All right, everyone, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for folks tuning in and your great questions. And um, Tate, I think we've got that one final slide. So thanks again. Here's how you contact us at the Maine Center for Coastal Fisheries. And uh, again, a thank you to our sponsors, Bar Harbor Bank and Trust, Camden National Bank, and the Island Fishermen's Wives Association. And again, a remote applause for um, Nick, Aaron, and Tim. Have a good one. Have a good afternoon and happy Halloween, folks. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone.